How's it going everybody? So in this video, I'm going to be sharing my own personal top tips and recommendations on how I feel like the average person can obtain the life that they desire and what I would say would be the path to not only ultimate health physically, but ultimate health mentally and spiritually as well. I feel like these are the golden keys that really create long-lasting happiness, fulfillment, and um, these are basically the tools. This is like my toolbox to creating an awesome life. And this is pretty much what I did, although some of these areas um, still require like a deep dive every now and then. So without further ado, we shall begin. The first thing on my list is something that I've previously kind of denounced, uh, but not realizing that the average person would actually significantly benefit from this. So when you're first starting on a self-development journey, you should probably read self-help books. I think uh, self-help books are amazing, mostly because the average person, they are their most of their problems in life are coming from limiting beliefs. They're coming from a um, jaded perspective on how things are and it's coming from basically uh, unproductive programming in their mentality and what self-help books do is they offer you a different perspective on different areas of your life usually aiming to obtain success in these various areas now the problem is people first of all they they uh, pay too much attention to the wrong self-help gurus and the wrong self-help books that don't really give them the perspective necessary to move far, you know, to move forward. A lot of self-help gurus really have no actual experience in the field or no credibility, or if they do, a lot of their success didn't actually come from the tips that they share in their self-help books. It came from other means, and so when you follow their advice, you may not get the same success that they might have. But most self-help books are written by gurus that really shouldn't be sharing information, which is a huge reason why I don't even talk about self-help and stuff on my channel as much as I used to. My channel used to be very philosophy and psychology oriented. A lot of people don't know that. Um, however, there are a couple of... Oh, and actually, that's the, another problem is that people get addicted to self-help and they stay in this uh, kind of circle of uh, reading self-help books and feeling like they achieve something and then reading more and more and more self-help books just to get the feeling that they're achieving something when in reality they need to be taking more action and actually putting those principles into practice. So I think it's important to emphasize minimalism and your information sources. Focus on the key fundamental texts that make the most difference. Again, again, this principle, the 20% of methods that yield you 80% of results. This is important in all areas that we're gonna be talking about. And I always mention this principle because in this age of infinite gurus and experts in information, we only have so little time that we can dedicate and we don't really need a shit ton of different information sources, let alone different supplements and herbs and books and all this crap. You only need the most effective ones. And that's what my channel is about is helping you all find the shortcut, right? Find those 20% that yield you 80% of results because I've already put in the hours. Um, and so some of the books I'd start off with in the self-help in the self-help uh, section, okay? This is not spirituality or new age. This is different, okay? This is self-help. This is only practical books that deal with the physical world. I have other kind of recommendations for spirituality, but most people are not on that level yet, okay? Um, so the books for self-help that I'd recommend are the authors. I would recommend How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I know that that is a very like cliche, common thing to recommend, but it'll teach you the basic foundations of how 
uh, social interactions work and it'll teach you kind of like strategies to um, build more fulfilling uh, interactions when you're brand new. Like if you're not having the friendships and the relationships at work and, and even with clients that you might work with, if you're a salesperson or whatever, um, even your dating life, all of these uh, can be uh, remedied if you start by emphasizing these principles. Really what you need is real world experiences and trial and error to see what works and what doesn't in your experience. But, and, and so how to win friends and influence people is not an advanced level understanding of social dynamics, but it will get your foot in the door. So I think that that is very, very important. The second one is going to be Awakening the Giant Within by Anthony Robbins. So, you know, Anthony Robbins has been around since the dawn of self-help and the new, you know, the new boom of it or whatever. And uh, the thing is, he's worked with dozens of high-level celebrities and athletes and I think some presidents as well. He is the GOAT, the greatest of all time in the self-help genre. And his book, Awakening the Giant Within, is one of the fundamental texts for how to fix your life. And this is going to be fix solving limiting beliefs. It's going to be how to change your state and elevate your baseline level of well-being using your internal kind of thoughts and things. He talks a lot about value systems um, and, and how to live a life of purpose or principle. And this is a very practical book for people that don't want to deal with like spiritual stuff like you know or or whatever the law of attraction and crap which i think is a good thing but it it requires a baseline level of reality before you can get to that and otherwise you're just going to be kind of like one of these people who believe in like crystals and chakras and stuff you know and, and you want to start with things that actually work so that you can actually see these greater spiritual principles in practice really they get solved through other means you don't have to what delve into spiritual books or whatever to get the actual experiences okay in fact you'd be better off getting those real world experiences that actually um, make you feel some of these greater principles like the like reality is mental correspondence and these other things you actually get real world experience when you start to experience successes in your life so you don't need to read these other things right you don't need to become a monk or anything. But uh, anyway, yeah. So Awakening the Giant Within is great uh, just as a baseline starting point because it will teach you pretty much all areas of your life will be covered by that one. The third one on the list is one that I read in early 2019 that really let, you know made me feel motivated and gave me a more down-to-earth understanding of other people and why certain people – you know, don't learn from their problems and, and everything else. And it's called uh, The Magic of Thinking Big by Dr. Schwartz, who has a PhD in psychology. Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, I believe it's The Magic of Thinking Big. It's, uh, the, the book covers white and blue. I have it in my closet somewhere with all my other books I always mention. Uh, and I saw it at um, the bookstore yesterday actually and it, and it reminded me of how much of an impact it had on my life the magic of thinking big is a very practical down-to-earth uh, book it is not all about optimis optimism and whatnot it talks about um, in fact it, it talks a lot about uh, how to get the social relationships you want the friendships you want and it talks about why it's important for you to set um, goals, first of all, long-term goals, no matter how grandiose they might sound, as well as midterm goals, short-term goals, and the power of those goals and how they keep you on track. And, uh, and it talks a lot about kind of breaking out you know, of, of, a, of a scarcity type mold. And uh, gives you, and it, it talks a lot in the context of marketing and, um, and, and, and sales. So for people who are looking for a way of improving their life, again, in a practical sense that they can relate to if they're not yet on that spiritual level, which, again, most people watching my YouTube channel probably shouldn't be paying too much attention to spiritual stuff in the first place until they get this practical 
uh, experience of, of, of success. But yeah, so the magic of thinking big, I, I think you should really read that book. If there's any book on this list, the magic of thinking big and, and awakening the giant within, I think that kind of covers the basis. And the thing is there are a lot of other self-help books that you can read, but, uh, that are, that are good. Oh, and the seven habits of highly effective people is really awesome too. There's a reason why it's such a staple. Um, but I think that that, I think that that's about it really. I think those are the best ones. Seven habits you can read later. Um, you know, there's a lot of other ones too that I enjoyed. Um, but yeah, I think those are the most important ones. Again, 20% of methods that yield you 80% of results, right? So, um, you know, that comes before obsessing over physical health. Because if you don't have your actual, like, life in order in your, in your mind, and you don't understand, like, you know, you don't have some kind of vision for each area of your life and what you want to achieve, you're going to be one of these people who just, like, mindlessly consumes information, whether it's self-help, whether it's spirituality crap, whether it is um, health and nutrition information, biohacking, whether it's politics, you know what I mean? Like the, the number one inner drain of health, well-being, energy in all aspects that's ruining people's lives is what would be taken care of when they have the fundamental areas in check that are solved by some of these books. Um, and now I'm going to mention some, some, well, I'll mention spiritual crap like at the end of this video because I think it's beneficial, but uh, yeah, but just not until you have practical life experience. Uh, so before we move on, if you don't want to read a whole book, ma uh, look at Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Like everyone who's taken an introductory psychology course probably has seen the Maslow's chart in some way or form. Where it talks about, you know, at the base of pyramid, you have survival needs, then you have kind of like social needs, then you have uh, purpose and self actualization goals, and it gives you a hierarchy on how to structure different areas of your life. The problem is, most people, they just, their whole life is all unorganized and it's scattered, and people think they hyper focus on one area. They're like, I need to have the best health ever, and the, one, until my health problems are solved, I can't have a social life, which I used to do as well until I realized, wait a second, this is why I feel like crap. Not only was it the pro health problems that was caused by the vegan diet, for me at least, um, and my mentality was crazy till I had tonic herbs, but without a proper social life, it's kind of hard to practice a lot of the good energy you might have. If you're just laying in your bed all day watching so, you know, videos on self-help or health or health or binge watching these things you don't really get out you don't really talk to people you don't have some kind of uh tribe that you're a, you're a part of then you're never going to know if like you feel better or not right anyway so get that shit on check uh so as far as health and nutrition is concerned right uh so i'm gonna start just recommending books here um i think the first thing that people should read i like Personally, so you should read an actual nutri nutrition textbook. Um, so there's a couple nutrition textbooks. I'm trying to think of, of one of them. Um, God damn it! Is it is it? Um, man, I can't I can't even can't even come come think up of one of them. Um, but uh, you need to read a nutrition textbook, okay? I have quite a few in my uh, nutrition textbooks in my in my closet right now, kind of scattered around. Um, but uh, at a baseline, anything that is and it's important to get one that's updated, okay? Anything that's 2018 and above probably is going to be it's going to be good to go, just because nutrition science is like a constantly evolving field. And just a basic, I think it's called Practical Nutrition, I think was the one I was going to recommend. I'm trying to think of the beginner's one that I'm trying to come up with. But uh, 
basically the reason why is because there's a lot of bullshit in uh, some of these like um, these common books you might read by one expert. You know, you read like Dr. Josh Axe's like eat dirt diet or whatever the fuck collagen diet, which is trying to sell his collagen supplements and stuff. I haven't even read that book, honestly, but, um, you know, you'll have Dr. Gundry's like plant paradox. Uh, you'll have like Gary Tobbs book, the case against or the case for keto, which by the way, I think Gary Tobbs and some of these books that are written like Gary Tobbs books, I don't think are bad. Be, uh, as long as you don't fully believe what the author's saying, you need to take these. Uh, so textbooks teach you the basic fundamentals. They teach you um, kind of like some of the things that are established or that are mostly established. Because remember, it's a soft science. Everything is based on gathering evidence. And we can only know what's most likely true based on all of the various forms of evidence we have. But we don't know what the facts are. We have to combine all these little clues to tell us, like, hmm, this seems to be what's going on here. So even textbooks and, the, you know, these things teach us kind of like things that work good enough for us to have a practical working application of things. After you, after you read the textbook and you have like a basic groundwork in which physiology works from. Because basic things like cal how calories in versus calories out works, all the various mechanisms that influence calories in versus calories out. For example, the thermic effect of food or the thermic effect of feeding, like protein metabolism burning more calories, uh, thyroid hormone and its effects on, on thermogenesis, and things like this. And then, of course, how foods are digested. Okay. All of these things are pretty well established um, through metabolic ward studies. Or, um, you know, feeding tube studies or like what happens if you, uh, consume a lot of white rice without B1 or something, you get berry berry, which is a nutrient deficiency disease. So these things are pretty well established. You learn a lot of these things from textbooks and a good example of, uh, and this will prevent you from getting bamboozled. Uh, so people, for example, who say, um, that protein rots in the colon or even in the intestine, okay? That, that meat rots in the intestine. This can be easily avoided, like being bamboozled by crap, by, by misinformation like that. If you read a basic nutrition textbook because it explains uh, how protein, like animal protein especially, is mo especially animal protein. In fact, more like not beans, but animal protein is actually mostly broken down and turned to to chime or turned to liquid almost in the stomach. So it doesn't it breaks down almost completely before it even touches the intestine. Okay? So it doesn't have a chance to rot. Like we know this fact from and it's in textbooks from uh feeding tube studies where they take out people's um uh, intestine and they have like a tube instead and you can actually see when you eat animal protein that it when it enters the the artificial intestine at least the you know the tube you could see that the animal protein actually is like liquid okay it's almost completely disintegrated and then when you eat beans like a plant source of protein and other kind of like plant foods it goes through the intestine, through the stomach, the same way it, it came in. It was chewed up or whatever. So we know, and then of course, bacteria ferments the plant foods, but not the protein, and that causes farting, right? And then you have these dumbasses who, who say protein farts, who are like, oh, nice protein farts. Protein doesn't cause farts. And, you know, like, that's a long kind of thing to get at, across. But the point is, we know these things based on real experiments in real life where we can see the cause and effect. And this is mentioned in, in, in physiology, physiology textbooks. They have sections on this. So it's very important that our nutrition information, it, it, we start with a basic nutrition textbook. Okay. Same thing with sports nutrition. How are you going to train athletes if you don't know how food is digested and stuff? You need to start with a basic nutrition 
textbook and then move on to sports nutrition because the you know people be like oh i'm gonna eat oatmeal before my workout to fuel my workout like bro carbs don't work that way that oatmeal is going to take hours to digest it's not going to be digested until probably then you know if you if you eat oatmeal at 8 a.m it's probably not going to be digested till maybe 6 p.m in the evening especially if you work out afterwards that shit's just going to be slushing around your stomach. Uh, it's just, yeah. So, um, so when you hear these like vegans, you know, so when you hear some of these things, you'll know it's bullshit if you have the textbook knowledge. But after the textbook knowledge, then you have a baseline level of understanding to interpret some of these other people's insights and ideas. And a big problem that people have with nutrition, science, and stuff like that is that they think that the textbooks is all they need. That's why you get all you get a lot of doctors who don't even actually read nutrition textbooks. They might have one course in nutrition, probably a couple actually, um, but they don't study in their spare time, right? The main benefit of having a college level understanding of nutrition is not that you know everything about nutrition, but it's now you're armed with the tools necessary to do your own self study and look into the research and whatnot and find things you may have missed and also recognize phenomena in your patients and your clients. You know, if you have a client that, that something's happening with a, uh, some kind of food or something and this does not seem logical based on what you learned in school well that is actually an area where now you're armed with the prerequisites necessary to understand what's going on right doctors will commonly be like oh there's no way that um beans can be causing your psoriasis psoriasis is an autoimmune disease and blah 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 you know meanwhile you have these carnivore people or these fruititarians or whatever who are reversing their psoriasis and it's not magical but the textbook understanding of how digestion works you understand these people probably have some kind of digestive condition going on that's not allowing them to digest certain foods and that's triggering autoimmunity but these doctors are like oh no it's placebo because they haven't read the exact mechanism in their study in their in their schoolwork or whatever so this is why textbook is important it's not the facts, it's the baseline understanding. And now when you have something that doesn't make sense, you can look into the research and you can look back and try to, you know, play detective, you know. But if you don't have the textbook knowledge yet, if you don't read a basic textbook, um, then you're going to be bamboozled by charlatans like Dr. Berg, um, charlatans like... Uh, well, I would say maybe Stephen Gundry, but I don't know if I call him a charlatan. Um, what's the other one? Uh, maybe some of these alkaline vegans, Dr. CB, not to say his protocols don't work, but the reason why, again, we've talked about this in previous videos, some mechanism matters. You say, oh, I reversed my cancer on this raw vegan diet because meat is acidic and rots in your intestine. It's like, well, you reverse the cancer, that is documented. However, the mechanism, there's people who might have reversed the same cancer on a meat-only diet. It's not the removal of meat, there's a lot of other variables. This is why people often say anecdotes are stupid and blah, blah, blah. But it, it, that is also kind of stupid. Let's just disregard all anecdotes, right? Like, no. Okay, the same, it's the same thing. You need science and you need anecdotes. Uh, anyway, but you need the understanding of physiology to understand the anecdotes. You need the, the anecdotes to kind of give you a practical know-how of how to apply that science. So after you have like the, I think it's Practical Nutrition, I believe is the book, okay, for beginners. Uh, it's been a long time since I read that book. Uh, textbook. Um, then... You can, and by the way, the, the, the NASM, National Academy of Sports Medicine uh, Certified Nutrition Coach course uh, that I have right here, 
that is a really, really good course to go through, and it'll teach you everything you need to know if you really read the course material. That's a really good uh, certification course to go through. Uh, if not for the certification, for the information. It's written by all of the leading researchers in the field. And surprisingly enough, it, it's very nuanced and not dogmatic. So I really like that. Um, I was very surprised. was not expecting NASA to have such great information. Um, so after that, I would recommend reading the book by Sally Fallen called Nourishing Diets. Nourishing Diets by Sally Fallen is an amazing book it because it details what a lot of these ancestral paleolithic humans that we can study in, in modern times uh, with the last the last living indigenous ancestral humans were still eating if you in after taking a history class an American history class in college uh, I, I appreciate it even more because I realize a lot of these indigenous cultures, really have been around for thousands of years uh, living a similar lifestyle. Not to say they didn't evolve or anything, but to think that our ancestors were only carnivore and stuff like that. I mean, it, it's like, yeah, that might be mil a million years ago or something, right? But uh, we don't know for sure because we don't have hands-on experience if we just go by the uh, anthropological record or what have you. Um, and there's a really good talk, by the way, by um, Dr. – he wrote Protein Power. Uh, I think it was Boyd Eden – not Boyd Eden. Michael Eads. Dr. Michael Eads has a really good talk. It's called Paleoanthropology and the Origins of the Paleo Diet. You need to watch his original – like his older full version of the, of the talk over an hour. I think it was back in like 2007, 2012. There's multiple versions of it, but the older one is amazing. Talks a lot about why humans need to be eating a meat-based diet, basically, and I like that one a lot. Talks about why the Egyptians had obesity and stuff, which is now hotly debated by vegans, of course, uh, and that's fine. Um, but uh, nourishing diets by Sally Fallen goes into detail about how ancient you know indigenous populations who were studied by researchers they're still most likely following more closely uh hunter-gatherer lifestyles but they're taking advantage of a multitude of different food sources and they are um still living off the land they are but they're also using like uh wild foods like grains and, and tree barks and they're eating bugs and insects of all kinds they're having buffalo colon eating contests, and you get a lot of different varieties of diets depending on the population studied. And they go into detail about um, some of the – how the diets changed over the years and some of the diseases that came with it. The most amazing things about that book is, first of all, literally it's a compilation of Weston Price's uh, research and other uh, explorers research. They go into detail on China, on the China, on Asia and why those populations of people were so healthy. It talks it kind of debunks or debates the China study directly and it debates the blue zones by Dan Butner. Okay? And I have those books too. I have the Blue Zone Solution by Dan Butner. I have the uh, the China study by Callan Campbell. I read the opposing beliefs uh, narrative as well with the underlying basis in physiology from the nutrition textbooks. And I have physiology and anatomy textbooks too. Uh, and so I'm able to read these things with an open mind, right? Um, but anyway, yeah, Nourishing Diets by Sally Fallen is a, is a very good read. It, it kind of deep, you know, debates points of the China study and talks about Asian health and, and the blue zones and talks about the organ meats and stuff that these blue zones eat that you don't hear about in the plant-based narrative. Uh, talks about all of the, the uh, healthiest, uh, the indigenous populations and their health, the Pacific Islanders, the indigenous uh, Americans, uh, the, the Inuit, our Arctic people, you know, the Eskimos, the Maasai tribe, um, and a wide variety of some of these like so-called Paleolithic ancestors or whatever ancestral 
people talks about anti-nutrients and how these people would spend days like pounding potatoes into mush before they'd cook them to break up all the heavy fibers in them, uh, how they prepare grains. And, and, and this is just fundamental uh, uh, reading. It, I think this bridges a gap between people like Paul Saladino and, 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 uh, and whatnot and some of these autoimmune illnesses we're facing that are remedied by paleo, by paleo and, and carnivore diets. You know, because paleo diets just completely remove these grains, right? But the ancestral stuff by Sally Follin says, hey, it's not that the grains are bad. It's that you have to really prepare these properly to neutralize the anti-nutrients in the food, right? Um, you know, but it also emphasizes the importance of organ, organ meats and, 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 and these other nutrients. Um, and it talks about how these cultures were actually a lot more advanced than we believe, right? Like the Native Americans, there's a big kind of uh, stereotype that Native Americans were like in, in harmony with nature and, and just left everything in its natural state. When in reality, they were like the pioneers of agriculture. Uh, they would burn down uh, some of the trees and forests and stuff uh, and, and as a process of growing grains and, 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 and also just maintaining the land. You know, there there needs to be a maintenance of the land. Otherwise, certain uh, plants and, and, and other things and, and animals will outgrow, uh, will grow, uh, overgrow or whatever, like the to the point where it's detrimental to the environment, if that makes sense. But yeah, so Nourishing Diets by Sally Fallon. It, it is profound. Read that book. So the third nutrition book that I recommend reading is actually on herbalism. And it is Ron T. Garden's um, uh, – what is it? I, I have the book. I always – I've been reading the shit out of it lately. Ron T. Garden's book, first of all. Ron T. Garden is the, herb, the an American herbalist who brought the real traditional Chinese medicine herbalism and tonic herbalism uh, from Asia to America. So he's kind of like the Steven Seagal of herbalism. Uh, not to hopefully that's a compliment uh, because he basically, but he basically took the. But that's probably not a, a good compliment. He Ron T. Garden's amazing. He's like the best herbalist like on the planet still living. Um, but yeah, it's, it's Chinese uh, traditional Chinese medicine, superior herbalism, uh, obtaining radiant health. I think is the the edition of the book you want to read. Uh, so there's multiple versions of his book, okay, and they're hard to find. They're expensive as fuck. Like on Amazon, they all sell for like over a hundred dollars. Some versions are like over three hundred dollars. I think I bought mine for like sixty or eighty dollars on Amazon somehow. You might be able to find it from like other bookstores and stuff like that. Uh, you might be able to to find that find it uh, on like a thrift bookstore. But basically, what this uh, book talks about is um, it kind of has it, – it summarizes traditional Chinese medicine theory, the five elements, and then the three treasures. And the three treasures are the ones I, I think are really important as well as yin and yang. When you're working with herbalism, you'll find if you don't want to go too deep into it, the most important things for you to understand are jing, qi, and shen, and then yin and yang. Because with herbs, if you notice – uh, you can have a lot of weird results depending on the, the type of herb you take, the dose, the combination, and also you as an individual. And that's because we can't. It, it's good to have the scientific understanding of herbs and how they work using you know dopamine and neurotransmitters and hormones. But we have thousands of years of experience in this system of understanding energetics in Chinese medicine using these herbs, and it's – good to also have the energetic understanding and the traditional history of every herb. So this book ta explains all these things and then it has a list of like uh, over 20 of the superior tonic herbs, okay? Um, it talks about black, you know, it talks about um, uh, Romagna, ginseng, reishi mushroom and the different f forms. It talks about Gynostema, asparagus 
root, goji berry. Then it has honorable mentions. It mentions ephedra, which is interesting, um, which is like a, ca- a caffeine plant basically, but it's not really caffeine. It, ta- it mentions polyrachis, black ant, pearl. And then it has med- uh, medicinal herbs and supporting herbs uh, kind of in following chapters. Then it has various kind of formulations that you can create with the different herbs. And the ending of the book kind of shows you how you can mix and match different herbs for different purposes. But it's formulated almost in a catalog way for Ron T. Garden's herb website. And uh, I've, I've actually never used Ron T. Garden's herbs besides his Gynostemma, Spring Garden, Dragon Herbs, or whatever, tea or whatever, the, the Gynostemma tea that he sells, um, the longevity tea. But, but I'm sure they're really high quality. I have a client who actually used uh, one of his uh, black ant extracts and says it's really, really good. But... Uh, anyway, so it, it serves as a foundation for you to understand Chinese tonic herbs and gives you everything you need to know to understand them, how they're meant to be understood. After you read Ron Teagarden's uh, Superior, you know, is, is Obtaining Radiant Health or whatever Chinese medicine book, you read that fucking book, then you can read systematic reviews of the scientific literature on all the evidence we have and information we have in the scientific literature. Uh, on every herb, right? So you read uh, about reishi mushroom in his book, and then you read the latest uh, systematic review in the scientific literature on reishi mushroom. It'll tell you about its influences on hormones and dopamine and the the human trials we have so far, and and all these things and its effects on glutathione and and, and interleukin six and these inflammatory cytokines. Um, so that's kind of how you want to do it. You read the fundamental text first. Then you read the scientific literature second, and then you read all the other books too. Like there's other books on reishi mushroom and and Panax ginseng. Like I've spent a little bit too much money on individual textbooks on each herb. Um, what's another one? Like uh, R- reishi mushroom, the the mushroom of immortality by uh, I forgot the guy's name, but it's his whole story on how he found reishi mushroom. And his journey and all the different experiences he had with it. And then there's like ginseng, um, like the, the, the herb of the king of herbs or whatever. And it goes in all the scientific literature on ginseng and everything. So, uh, yeah. So there's a lot of other nutrition books that you can read. But, um, you know, there's like, um, what's the other one? The, the paleo... Yeah, I mean, you know, you can kind of ch- pick and choose. Like, after you've read these books, I think it's cool. You can read the vegan books, right? Uh, read um, uh, Dr. Campbell's The China Study, and you'll <laughs> – I don't know if you'll want to read – you know, you'll be able to read that without cringing too much after you know these other things. You can read um, – what's another good one? Um Alan Aragon is, is, is a great kind of scientific researcher in the evidence-based field, and he just recently published a book. I'm sure that one's good. You'd start to read the newest books and, and, and then some of the older classics. Oh, yeah, um, The Art and Science of Low-Carb Performance by Stephen Finney and Jeff Volok is a good complement to a uh, sports nutrition book just because it kind of fills in the gaps of the, um, the basic nutrition textbook and then the sports nutrition textbook. It'll kind of make you understand how ketogenesis actually works uh, in these applications that are not accounted for. Um, yeah. So, and I mean, there's a lot of vegan books so you can read. Like, I don't want this to be like a paleo is the way type of book, but like, do you really think that it's like like we have the scientific understanding, then we have the evolutionary understanding from nourishing diets and Sally Fallen, right? You have evidence base from the textbook, then you have how humans actually survived through Sally Fallen's work. Then you can read the the essays and the textbooks by the nutri- by the vegan gurus. Um, you know, again the the blue the blue blue zone solution by Dan Butner. Uh, Colin Campbell's China study, 
you can read Neil Bernhard's book, uh, how to reverse diabetes. Um, you can read, um, Dr. Ben Bickman's book, like why we get sick. Um, but I think, uh, what's another one? Is it Den not Denise Menger? I mean, that's a good book too, Sacred Cow, but, uh, there's another one that really hits the mark. Uh, I forgot her name, but she comes out of like Rob Wolf's kind of camp as well. Uh, anyway, um, let's see. So now we got exercise and training. Okay. Oh, and I think Mark Hyman's book, the ultra mind solution is great because it gives you a uh, comprehensive overview on hormones and neurotransmitters and how that kind of fits in. And it kind of explains what's wrong with the mainstream medical paradigm on, on psychiatry. But his actual recommendations, like he has a free questionnaire I think is still available even if you don't buy the book. It can help you understand what neurotransmitters you might want to work on. Even though there's a lot of like new science available that kind of might interfere with that information, but I think it's still relevant. Um, so anyway, let's talk about training and exercise. So this is a really hard one. Uh, really, I think the best information comes from Barbell Medicine on strength training. R watching their three-part programming series is very enlightening. The problem is that most of the average people don't have enough understanding of all the highly complex terminology and principles. So if you watch Barbell Medicine's uh, three-part lecture on training programming, you'll have no clue on what the fuck they're saying or how it applies. And for me, even with my, my comprehensive background and experience in the science on it, I had to watch that whole – it's like a five-hour series on fucking training programming. I had to watch that shit like four times before it really started to click. Um, but I would recommend that after you already have like a strength and conditioning certification and stuff. Uh, so the problem is most of the mainstream paradigms on training and, new, and training adaptations are missing a lot of information. And sometimes they're outright wrong. But the nitty gritty is, so basically the first thing books you want to read is going to be, um, I would recommend Practical Programming by Mark Ripito. I think it's the third edition. The reason why I want to read that book is because it, it basically summarizes the most important parts of the mainstream paradigm. Uh, it mentions stress, recovery, adaptation. It mentions um, supercompensation overreaching and it kind of kind of mentions like adaptation versus fatigue uh, but it contextualizes training stress and then it gives you a basic uh, novice program and it teaches you how to fit training and structure training uh, throughout the week the problem though is after you like the the the, the way that they do it is just basically working to a maximum every single time. It's not a good application without a better understanding of stress and recovery. Uh, you can't just keep adding five pounds every session. So eventually they switch to adding five pounds a week. That is not a good way to train, but it, it gives you again, the fundamental understanding of how things work. Uh, there's other books out there like the, um, the, Essentials of Strength and Conditioning by like the the National Strength and Conditioning Association. I have a very old version of that book, but you should probably get the most updated version. That one's good and gives you a more broad understanding of different, uh, like especially if you're training athletes. That one's a really good book. Um, and in fact, it's probably better that you start with, I mean, whatever. Start with practical programming, then read. Mark is uh, Mike is Dr. Mike Israel and uh, Chad Wesley Smith and Dr. James Hoffman's book, The Scientific Principles of Strength Training. Start with practical pro practical programming for strength training, and then read my, Dr. Mike Israel's Scientific Principles of Strength Training. And what happens is you can actually take the templates and and the basic stuff you learned from practical programming by Mark Ripito, and then you can use the scientific principles of strength training to help you optimize those programs. And then you could add sets and add reps and you can customize those templates 
in a way that gives you long-term sustainable results. And if you start to feel overtrained, which is not really overtraining, it's overreaching, but if you start to notice plateaus and stuff, you can take what you learn from these, from the scientific principles of strength training, and you can effectively navigate your, your way forward in training. Because practical, practical programming gives you templates and a baseline level of understanding when you're brand new. It's a very easy thing to understand. It's probably the easiest kind of book that lays everything out and gives you the tools you need to start right now. But long-term progress requires a deeper understanding of how shit works. And so to understand strength adapta- uh, stress recovery adaptation or stimulus recovery adaptation and, and what you need to continue forward, you need that deeper understanding of, of how shit works. And even for athletes, for coaches who are trying to program mixed martial arts training, the scientific principles of, the, the, of strength training by juggernaut training systems and renaissance periodization is key. You could buy that from the juggernaut strength training's website for like 50 bucks. You try to buy it on Amazon, it's way too expensive. And it'll teach you um, how to manage fatigue. Fatigue management is very important. It'll teach you that... If you keep doing the same, uh, the same exercises and the same rep ranges over and over again, your body gets – the adaptations get stale. You get what's known as adaptive resistance where your body doesn't really ad- adapt anymore. And so it teaches you the importance of, cha- of, of training a certain way consistently for a couple months and then changing the rep range and changing the exercise variations. And what will happen is you get long-term progress uh, that's pretty predictable if you just use these principles and you have a template to to roll from. So again, it's taking a fundamental text and then taking the advanced text and and making that shit better. And then on top of that, uh, YouTube YouTube channels that you can use to kind of stay up to date in the research and, and whatnot if you're into that. Is going to be Stronger by Science, that's number one, by Greg Knuckles and, and Eric Trexler. And then uh, Iron Culture Podcast, which is a little bit more bro-y, uh, with Omar Isoff and Dr. Eric Helms. And then, obviously, Renaissance Periodization with Dr. Mike Isretel. And he talks a lot about various other sports and, and tries to break myths and stuff. Um, and it's important that you understand keto and you understand these other things and nutrition first uh, because these people are operating from the mainstream paradigm of nutrition. And so you hear kind of ketogenic diet hating from a lot of these people. That is not balanced until you've read Stephen Finney and Jeff Falux are in science of low carb performance, right? Again, you can't buy in just one expert. That's why we have all these different books. So you got to pull from, uh, and then Barbell Medicine is good, but they don't really post as much. Maybe following their Instagram is a little bit better idea. Um, and there's a couple others too. I mean, uh, Chad Wesley Smith is a good kind of practical hands-on channel to pull from. So, yeah, so those are really good for like training. So what about like athletes, right? Um, so if you, it, it's going to depend. So training athletes needs to start with the base of strength. And then if you're, if you're, if it's mental health, even right, that's a specialization. You need to have specific understanding of how to exercise for mental health. Some of these evidence-based channels like uh, stronger by science talks about that and have episodes dedicated to that or how to train for jujitsu. You can read, um, the book, uh, grapple strong by Josh Bryant. That'll teach you how to apply strength training to, uh, jujitsu. There's another one, um, I recommend Lauren Landau's uh, MMA conditioning book. That's one. That's probably the best one because it teaches you specific conditioning energy systems that aren't talked about in other books. Uh, how to use like how to endure uh, different forms of endurance and and whatnot and strength and power. They're explained in that book. Um, and so yeah, so that's important. If you're trying to learn how to do strength and conditioning for football, read a book on how to apply strength and conditioning for football. But after you have a basic understanding of how strength and conditioning works. Too many people just jump to specializations. 
Okay, so now um, we're going to move on to spirituality, okay? So I'm going to keep this one short. Uh, I think a lot of people, if you get all, if you get the self-help first, then you get the nutrition and the tonic herbs dealt with, and then you have a life purpose, a process of mastery, right? Read the book Mastery by Robert Greene um, or, beca- or The Way of the Superior Man. Even maybe if you even if you're a female, I guess, but it's it's really kind of one sided and whatnot. But it'll teach you some of the things you need to know about how to feel fulfilled as a man, I guess, or just as a human, honestly. Um, a lot of these spiritual things work themselves out after you have these basic understandings. But uh, let's say okay, so for spirituality, here's what you what the books. Here's what I recommend. I recommend understanding um, Hermetics, the seven hermetic principles uh, and also understand that the the ta- the emerald tablet is bullshit we don't actually know what it is what it really says we don't know where it actually came from uh and all of the translations over the years have kind of really diluted what it originally meant you can't read the emerald tablet in our modern times and actually interpret it properly uh even like one line that was talking about talismans for example it was completely mistranslated, and for years, people were trying to figure out what it meant and writing a whole bunch of like books, um, like hundred pages pages long on on this one book on this one line in the Emerald Tablets about uh, talismans. And it turns out it was a mistranslation all along, and that's why it didn't make sense. But human beings have this weird urge to like overcomplicate and, and extrapolate meaning where meaning doesn't exist, and so. Anyway, yeah, to read to learn more about that, I recommend uh, the YouTube channel Esoterica by PhD ph- uh, philosopher, basically Justin, Doctor Justin Sledge, and he talks a lot about that. But uh, I think the Seven Hermetic Principles is a great kind of place to start uh, learning about the Corpus Hermetica and Hormetics is, is a good kind of place to go. Um, uh, the Kabbalah is a great kind of resource, especially if you're like a one of those Christian folk. It kind of kind of brings um, the how to see spirituality through a familiar lens, I guess. But I think that's like a better interpretation of the Bible and a good practical way to use it to get a life of fulfillment and to really feel those elevated states of spirituality. Hermetics is all about moving through the spheres. It's about progressing through the spheres and internal alchemy and taking the energy that you have and boosting it. Enlightenment almost. And that's a really – I don't even really want to talk about this because just, it's just such a <laughs> – so far out of most people's understanding and grasp, especially because most people try to skip reality and move to spirituality and – that is a problem because now you don't really have a way to understand spirituality that actually works. <laughs> but uh, basically, you start. This is the thing: you start off with one level of understanding, and then you keep moving up and up and up until, first of all, you understand it's all meaningless. Spirituality is meaningless, and effective kind of spirituality, effective usage of enlightenment doesn't look like enlightenment at all. And it's a paradox, but you don't understand that till you've already reached that peak. And so some of the most enlightened people on the planet, you won't know because they realize how stupid it would be to like preach enlightenment. <laughs> uh, and so, but anyway, seven hermetic principles about moving through the spheres. They, t- they, they talk about initiating your, someone into the, the spiritual teachings and there's levels and they te- the the different kind of texts and, and, and information in the in the Hermetica, which is a compilation of all sorts of different information and knowledge, it it goes by levels. You and we in in our modern times we don't know the order in which these books are even meant to be read in, but if you have a practical kind of working with these experiences with this, is kind of you'll find your way, I guess. But uh, that that an easier thing for people to do, okay, is you can kind of read some of these more modern interpreters that actually started off reading the Kabbalah and started off reading this the about the Hermetica, 
and they've kind of translated it into New Age. So a lot of this New Age philosophy, the Rhonda Byrne and The Secret, okay? Um, the Secret is actually, in my opinion, a really good book to, to read. And a lot of people who are into spirituality, who have a really weird, warped kind of view on things, uh, don't, wanna, don't want someone to think of it that way. But uh, I think the original book, The Secret, is a good starting place because it teaches you a lot of the teachings that you'll understand at the highest level of the hermetic teachings. Without polarity and rhythm, though, it doesn't kind of talk about that. But uh, another book would be The Power of Awareness by uh, Neville Goddard. But at the same time, it, I think there might be some aspects missing to that. But I think uh, Neville Goddard's The Power of Awareness um, is a good way for people to get experiences with spirituality and really correspondence and, and me mentalism, which are the first two principles of hermetis, hermeti, hermetics. Uh, if you start to apply the law of assumption and you start to apply some of Nev Neville Goddard's teachings, you'll start to have hands-on experiences with the top two, the first two uh, principles of hermetics. And you'll start to see that there's a lot more to life than what we can identify using um, our logical brain. And so the majority of my information on my YouTube channel and in this video so far is based on is science, it's logic, mixed with a little bit of practical reality and, and anecdote. But I also am like, whoa, there's this whole other world that can't be explained by <laughs> And that's why spiritualities last. And also because we live in the visceral world, and when you bec when you reach this top tier, this top tier of spirituality, you realize that all of the fun and the and the the lessons you learn through this medicism and, and and spirituality is needs to it is in the real world, and you're like, whoa! whoa, whoa. So now I got to go back to this shit. So I think Rhonda Byrne actually gives people kind of a blueprint to use uh, hermeticism and spiritual teachings in a practical way that, that, that the average person can apply immediately if they read, fix a lot of their life problems. Like a lot of the stuff that you'll read in, in some of the self-help books I mentioned at first can probably be completely resolved just reading, you know, applying the secret, uh, but also not talking to people about the law of attraction, the secret, because that will actually violate some of the things you learned in the uh, how to win friends and influence people. And then also when you're at the very top tier of enlightenment, you actually realize talking about enlightenment and shit with other people is like, uh, not really productive. Uh, and doesn't make sense. Um, so, but the secret is a good way to just skip a lot of this crap. Uh, but the problem is you're not going to be able to recognize a secret as a good kind of spiritual text or even it being spiritual at all. Because, again, you're probably in the lower tiers of hermeticism. <laughs> so, uh, and so you're going to think of like uh, suffering and all this other stuff as spirituality. And it's like, well, all of these spiritual practices uh, try to achieve a similar thing to what you'll kind of learn when you get into that kind of stuff. It's just you don't realize it yet because um, you're still grounded in the real world. And, and, and so, yeah, it's weird. It's interesting. So anyway, uh, hopefully this has helped. Uh, I'm running out of time. Leave your question in the comments down below and I'll talk to you guys next time.